The other thing is, so in the olden days, uh, I, I worked on, I don't know if you remember this, I geared you 178 maintenance paclitaxel. You know, maintenance makes so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, I've been involved in the maintenance bevacizumab, and certainly now I'm involved, all of us are involved in maintenance PARP inhibitors. The reason maintenance paclitaxel was a bad idea, because it didn't work very good, it, very well, it was toxic, and it was inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So now we have medications that are less toxic, more efficacious, and it's a pill. Yeah, right. So, so it's no surprise in Solo One that the patient reported outcomes did not show a decrement which you could never do with paclitaxel causing neuropathy and alopecia and, and so on. Loss. Exactly, that's great. Right. You know, yeah. the biggest right. challenge right. with that, with that uh, particular drug was the capsule forms, which yeah. has now been solved because but with the tablet this is all right. on tablet, right. which is easy to take. So let's, let's talk about the historical evolution. So on December 19, 2014, uh, you mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, uh, got mm -hmm. a LAPRIB approved in the capsule form for treatment. Treatment. Mm -hmm. Three prior regimens. Germline mutation Germline, right. treatment, 137 mm -hmm. patients, 34% response rate. And then on August 17, 2017, almost three years later, it became this maintenance indication, second line, solo two mm -hmm. in study 19. <clears throat> and now we have frontline and undoubtedly, it'll be FDA approved probably early in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we had treatment, second line maintenance, frontline maintenance, mm -hmm. what's next? So I think what's next is, is you know, really determining better biomarkers for responsiveness okay. to single agent PARP inhibitors. And I, and I also, you know, you I know we're- beyond BRCA, you mean? Uh, so, um, well, not just, I think for all patients. So okay. certainly for, for those patients, I mean, not all patients who have underlying germline or somatic okay. BRC yeah, mutations right. are gonna respond. Okay. Um, we always think that way and we hope that, but it doesn't always work out that way, unfortunately. Um, so better marker markers and then combination strategies. Okay. Um, and you know, I know we've talked about Olaparib, but obviously there's Rucaparib um, and Niraparib, both of which also have maintenance and are also doing trials in, in, in earlier um, settings so as well. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So Niraparib, mm -hmm. uh, very mm -hmm. different medication. You mm -hmm. know, I used to think that these medications are more similar than different. Niraparib is more lipophilic. Uh, uh, it's given at a lower dose. Mm -hmm. It's given once daily um, and has some thrombocytopenia challenges, but now we're learning that if you're underweight, if you have a low baseline platelet count, we start at a reduced dose. So there's a study Prima, frontline niraparib. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, I think that um, that's an equally interesting study compared to Solo One. It's very similar to that, with the exception being that uh, the, you know, the company involved, and as you know, because you're in, uh, the PI of that trial, um, had the foresight to think about, you know, are, are the only patients who are going to benefit from PARP inhibitors BRCA patients? There you go. And, uh, Beyond BRCA. That's right. HRD. And, 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 and of course, NOVA demonstrated that not only did germline mutation patients benefit, this is in a recurrent setting, but that HRD patients benefit, and then even non-HRD <clears throat> wild type BRCA patients. So everyone seems to be benefiting to a certain extent. And that Prima incorporates that. So Prima is so, so the first line trial of niraparib, all comers, but with the primary endpoint being HRD. Tell our audience what HRD is. So um, HRD stands for homologous recombination deficiency. It's the functional uh, outcome from the loss of BRCA1 or BRCA2, meaning that um, the cancer cells themselves cannot repair uh, double strand breaks. Mm -hmm. And that's a lethal event. So. Um, Measuring HRD is important. You can do it by sequencing individual genes as a sort of surrogate to it. Uh, but two companies, both uh, Myriad and the Foundation Medicine, have developed what's known as genomic scarring assays, mm -hmm. HRD assays. Uh, and I think there was a lot of excitement and hope that those would functionally identify patients whose tumors would respond to PARP inhibition. Uh, and, and the answer is sort of yes and no. I, I think it does show you an enriched group of patients um, whose tumors are sensitive to PARP, but, but it also clearly misses patients. So, so, so I personally don't use them very often. I got you. Not yeah. yet, because there's not an indication, yeah. but if Prima shows that there is, maybe mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. So what's the difference between DDR, HRD, and LOHI? Or are basically the same, the same. Well, I mean, I so so, so L O H. 
<laughs> loss of heterozygosity is sort of a measure uh, that is used for HRD. So uh, most of the assays that are, are HRD assays um, look at the loss of heterozygosity, meaning the DNA loss in the tumor, and it, they put a cutoff on it. Okay. And if you're LOH high, okay, you're HRD. If you're LOH low, your tumor is well-behaved, and you're not losing DNA, you're not likely to respond to a PARP uh, inhibitor. Now, there are twists in this in that the one assay from Myriad adds telomeric imbalance and a few other things, which I don't think is worth going into. But um, So there are a couple of different flavors for how one defines HRD. This is why, in my view, we don't understand it well enough. So figure yeah. it out. You're the translation <laughs> scientist. And, and I think, you know, and the other, and the other, th the other issue, just to, to build upon um, Mike's point, is that the HRD assays are typically done on initial tumors, so initial biopsies at a time of surgery or initial biopsy. But the concept is this, sort of the same, LOH high, D HRD, or this DDR, they sometimes mm -hmm. call it, to try to go beyond BRCA to assess the inability to repair double-stranded DNA right. breaks. And I think that's going to be important when you're thinking about PRIMA or another trial um, when you're using a PARP inhibitor up front. But when you're using it out back, and I think our, our practices will change to use PARP inhibitors more up front. Um, but we do still have a lot of women who are still receiving, who haven't had BRCA testing um, and are still going to get a PARP inhibitor. So that, that's where the HRD, I think, assays really do, don't do a good job. So basically, that's, basically you're, what you're saying is that the genomic scar remains. That's right. Even that's though correct. The, the, the clinical, the, the yeah. biology and the clinical yeah. pieces all do change. Well, yeah. the, as you know, right. all three PARP inhibitors are FDA approved in second line maintenance if you respond to mm -hmm, platinum-based mm -hmm, chemotherapy, right. mm -hmm. PR or CR. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is that in, in, in distinction from a, bi a biomarker, if the tumor can't repair a platinum-induced double-stranded break, they can't repair a PARP-induced double-stranded break. So right. it's, we, it's, it, it's kind of an opportunity to have a clinical biomarker rather than a molecular biomarker.